Acceptance Reflections Live. My name is Brandon, and I'll be your moderator today. Our guests this week are Corey, Bianca, and Connor. I'd like to remind everyone that we do this live stream every Monday at 12 p.m. PST and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. If you have any questions, please comment below, and we will answer your questions live on the stream. How are you guys doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank Good. you. <laughs> A little sick, but pretty pretty good other than that anything fun this weekend nope <laughs> <laughs> yeah i had fun i got a facial you did yeah oh i wish i got a facial did you do anything fun yeah i got tricked into a surprise birthday party that's that exciting didn't happen on my actual birthday that's exciting made it surprising big surprise yeah. <laughs> i got lost in a corn maze and it was like 98 degrees and it was humid that mm. wasn't that exciting, but the things right you do in recovery. Okay. <laughs> 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 hey. Start the reading. Yes. <clears throat> so our first topic is from the, a book called Daily Teachings. And it reads, whatever feelings you have within you are attracting your tomorrow. Worry attracts worry. Anxiety attracts more anxiety. Unhappiness attracts more unhappiness. Dissatisfaction attracts more dissatisfaction. And... Joy attracts more joy. Happiness attracts more happiness. Peace attracts more peace. Gratitude attracts more gratitude. Kindness attracts more kindness. And love attracts more love. Your job is an inside one. To change your world, all you have to do is change the way you feel inside. How easy is that? I'm going to disagree. I don't think it's easy. <laughs> um, I think it's really difficult to change the way you feel inside. What I was taught right early in sobriety was that um, your actions take place first and then it kind of changes the way um, you think and feel on the inside. All right, like uh, the more positive my attitude is and um, the more positive my actions are, like reaching out to other people, um, trying to show love and tolerance and things like that, then I'll feel better about um, myself and I'll have a better outlook on the world and my recovery and what's going on. Um, so I think it's kind of backwards for me. At least it, it has been for me. I don't know if anybody else feels any differently. Uh, well, I actually kind of agree with you. It's, it's simple but not easy, you know? Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, uh, the first part of this is kind of true, and the more I try to put that stuff out into the world, the more I try to be kind to people, the more I try to help people, the more I try to like show that gratitude and stuff, the more that starts to come up inside of me. And the easier it gets to like not let just a whole bunch of worry and anxiety and stuff just like take over my life and turn the whole world like gray and sad and mm -hmm. like depressing. And it, it took a while, a lot of practice, a lot of that was like very conscious effort on my part. But through all that practice, a lot of that has become habit, you know? Right. And I remember hearing people say when I was very new to sobriety, um, that life is good whether I perceive it to be or not. And that didn't really make sense at the time. It's like, well, no, life is kind of horrible. Like <laughs> I live in a halfway house, I'm wearing clothes from a donation bin. <laughs> right. Like, and, uh, like, I've come to learn they were right, mm -hmm. you know? Like, sometimes weird things happen, but big picture, life is all right, and the more I try to be kind to other people, loving, helpful, all that stuff, the less those, pro those problems don't seem as big as they used to. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's, you know, I agree with you, though. It's not just a matter of changing my mind about how I feel about a situation like there was some legwork that had to go into it. Yeah, I agree. You have to take action um, in order to feel, I'm not just gonna sit there and, you know, I was talking with someone today like, oh, this cheeseburger is gonna <laughs> appear right in front of me if I keep thinking about it. You know, there has to be action <laughs> <laughs> to, to what I do. But I do agree that if you're sitting there and like there, you have nothing to do and you're just feeling unhappy, if you keep feeling like thinking on the reasons why you're unhappy like nothing's gonna change um, and one thing for me that goes with like my recovery is my job is an inside one to change the world all you have to do is change the way you feel inside like what I 
got from that is like it doesn't matter where you are on the outside if you're homeless if you're living in a beautiful home if you're sleeping on a french couch like it just has to be you have to want it on the inside and you have to just yeah you just have to want it on the inside that's all i really have i agree with both of you and um it's just there has to be action as well as thinking about it um yeah I think the most common, uh, one of the most common sayings that I've heard and it stuck with me since the first time I heard it was that you have to act your way into right thinking instead of thinking your way into right acting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, my experience has shown that, right? Like my actions reflect my reality Mm -hmm. or my reality reflects my actions. Yeah. There we go. Something like that. (laughs) (laughs) The more positive I put out, the more positive I get back. Right. Pretty much. And it's kind of like my mom always says karma with things. Like if I'm going to be doing like shitty things to people, I'm going to get shitty things in return and um, treat others how you want to be treated, those types of things, like with other people. Um, Yeah. And... A lot of those actions when I was doing, you know, the wrong actions and trying to think my way into it, I was basing all that off of fear. Yeah. Like, I was afraid of whatever was coming my way. And the world is a lot less scary, the less, like, this is going to sound weird, but the less afraid of it that I am. Right. You know, there were a few things I didn't want to do that, for whatever reason, you know, judgment, like, consequences, whatever it was, I was just afraid to do it. And I went ahead, like, and did it anyway. Mm-hmm. I probably didn't have a choice or somebody was guilt tripping me into it. But not the point. I went mm-hmm. and did it. And having gotten over that small fear, the bigger ones I had became easier to face. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, that's, that's my thoughts on the matter. Do you want to move on to the next one? Yeah. All right. So we do have a comment from our audience. Uh, Adam Howard would like to say, Connor, you're the man. Um, Moving on from there, I do want to remind everyone that we do pay attention to the comments, and that's where we get a lot of our questions that we do um, discuss in this live stream. So if you do have any questions, feel free to comment below this video. Um, I am actively watching them, and so we will include those in part of the live stream. The next topic we're going to talk about is responsibility. We are not responsible for our disease, only for our recovery. As we begin to apply what we have learned, our our lives begin to change for the better from the basic text, page 91. The further we go in the recovery, the less we avoid responsibility for ourselves and our actions. By by applying the principles of a 12-step fellowship program, we are able to change our lives. Our existence takes on new meaning as we accept responsibility and the freedom of choice responsibility implies. We do not take recovery for granted. We take responsibility for our recovery by working the 12 steps with a sponsor. We go to meetings regularly and share with the newcomer that was freely given to us. We share with the newcomer what was freely given to us, the gift of recovery. We become involved with our home group and accept responsibility for our part in sharing recovery with the still suffering addict. As we learn how to effectively practice spiritual principles in all our lives, the quality of our lives improves. Just for today, using the spiritual tools I've gained in recovery, I am able I am willing and able to make responsible choices. I I don't know. I understand the sentiment they're driving at, but knowing me the way I do, I'm absolutely willing, but not always able to make responsible choices. What do you mean? Yeah. Well, I just yeah. I do some irresponsible things from time to time. Stay out till three in the morning, like hanging out with friends before I have to work the next day. Anyway. Um, to you. Sorry. <laughs> what I, I like about this, and it it talks about this in the first in the first of the twelve steps. Um, we're not responsible for our disease; we're only responsible for our recovery. You know, and the first step is we're powerless over our disease, and our lives have become unmanageable. And once I understood that powerlessness. I understood that I wasn't responsible for anything that happened up to that point. You know, I really, like, yeah, I was the one who did the things I've done, but I didn't know any better. I had no other way to cope with life. I didn't know anything else better to do. I had no other way to act. And so I'm not responsible for what I've done. 
that being said, I'm absolutely responsible for cleaning up that wreckage. Mm -hmm. And now I know that going forward. So anything that I do wrong is absolutely my responsibility. And so it relieved a lot of that guilt of like, I'm just a bad person coming in here. And it was like, no, I was just a lost person coming in here. Mm -hmm. And now that I've kind of found my way out of that, I'm responsible for continuing on that path. And part of that, like it talks about in here, is helping other people see that like, yeah, you've made some mistakes, but you don't need to rack yourself with guilt over those mistakes. You just have to go through and correct them. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of complicated because, like, I completely understand what you mean by saying that up until that point, you're not responsible for those actions and those things. And that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And those things are unfortunate, right? Um, it's hard to not use that as an excuse. But I think that knowing that kind of gives you a sense of relief mm -hmm. and that little bit of push that you need to, to clean up that past. Um, but yeah, like I said, like from that point on, I know. I know that I'm, that like I can't control this. That's just how it goes. But after I recognize that, I understand that I can take advantage of the spiritual tools and apply them to my life um, and I'm completely responsible for that I have I make those choices now right I make the choice to go to a meeting I make the choice to talk to new people um, these are things that I can do to prevent all that other crap mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you you kind of just took what I was gonna say it's like um, I don't want to repeat everything, so it's just like I can do things today. Like in my addiction, like I was, um, I wasn't able to do certain things because I, I was getting loaded, and that's all that mattered. Like I couldn't, um, I wasn't there for my sister's pregnancy. I wasn't there when my family members died. Like I wasn't there for anyone besides myself and besides like when I was looking for the drug and uh, using the spiritual tools I've gained in my recovery, I can make responsible choices. So it's like, I don't have a legitimate, I don't wanna say an excuse, like my dr drugs and alcohol weren't an excuse for me, but um, they made me not able to do certain things. And uh, yeah, I'm just able and can do things today because of my recovery and it's beautiful. Yeah, like just a quick example, you know, like I was talking earlier about like basing a lot of my decisions out of fear mm -hmm. and you know, fear of being dope sick, fear of whatever. And so in my using, there were times where I went out and I like, I stole things from people it, was, it happened, I'm not proud of it. And when I got to this point and I understood powerlessness, I'm not, when I say I'm not responsible for like what happened then, it's I don't need to feel guilty about that, but I am responsible for going back to those people and admitting what I've done wrong and, and finding out how I can make it right with them. Mm -hmm. That's where my responsibility lies, not in like just you know, coming down on myself for what a terrible person I was, you know, like, like I said, I, I didn't know any better at the time. That's just self-defeating. Yeah. yeah. But if I can, if I can, you know, just like lay that guilt aside, it was a thing that happened. I didn't know any better. I couldn't do anything better. And, you know, I, I can't keep feeling guilty about this. I have to face the fear of whatever's going to come my way and go to these people and make it right with them. And in doing that, the guilt was completely relieved mm -hmm. and it made it easier for me to go through and take responsibility for other parts of my life, even things that happened after I had gotten sober. Right. You know, I was able to, you know, admit my mistakes. I was, I understand, like, I'm not going to be perfect ever. I just have to take responsibility for being willing to grow and learn. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions or are you guys... <clears throat> Have anything else to say? I do have a couple of questions and comments. Um, the one thing that uh, one thing that I believe her name is Tressa said. She goes, "What has come easy was your addiction. You are responsible for your happiness." So thank you, Tressa, for that comment. Um, and then we have a question from Adam, and he says, "While this concept will make sense to the person who is in recovery, what about the family members who don't understand that can't understand 
that while in our addiction we were sick people and not bad people. I think he's referring to the concept of responsibility. It's, it's kind of hard to explain to someone who's never been through it. And I, I may have done a poor job of explaining what I meant. And it's not necessarily that I'm not responsible for my actions. It's that I'm not so responsible that I need to just destroy myself feeling guilty over what I've done. Like I mm -hmm. said, I didn't know any better. I had no other way to live. That was just the only thing I knew how to do to survive and handle the world as it was going on around me. Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain level of I didn't know any better, but like I said, I'm responsible going forward. Having learned that, that I didn't know any better at the time, I do know better now. So I'm responsible going forward to set that right. right. And it's hard to explain, you know, I have my own family that's pretty skeptical, that's been skeptical in the past. And it's hard to explain, it's harder to explain, I guess, than it is to demonstrate this to them. And I know that's not the best answer because it means this is going to take time and you're going to have to wait out to see how things turn out, but my family is much more interested in my actions going forward than they are in my words right now. You know, they've, mm -hmm. they've heard it too many times for any explanation to really mean anything to them, especially coming from me, but if they see the way I behave, they'll kind of internalize and understand, you know, I was a sick person then and I've gotten better now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you think about being sick, right? It's like, like, if I have the flu, I pretty much know that I have the flu. The mm -hmm. flu's been around for a long time. People know about it. People knows the people know the symptoms of the flu, right? Well, when I'm in active addiction, um, the symptoms of that are a lot different, right? And I didn't know and nobody could just tell me without first getting involved in recovery. And I think that I'm making these decisions. I think that I have a choice between using drugs and alcohol and not, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, com I'm confused. I'm so totally lost, it's the perfect word for it. Um, I don't know why I'm doing these things anymore, right? It just it's just the symptoms of the disease that I have. Well, after I find out about that, then, you know, I understand what's going on. I understand I have a choice of recovery and I can take those actions and do that. But before that, I am sick mm -hmm. and I don't even know it. And the symptoms are symptoms of somebody who's making bad choices, right? I'm not just making bad choices. I'm unable to make good choices mm -hmm. because I need drugs and alcohol. So, we have a <clears throat> pardon me. We have a comment that's from Cody Dash Amy, and they say, "I'm five years clean, but it just takes time for family to understand." Yep, I think that sums I, up I, pretty. That's good. true. Yeah, <laughs> it takes. Uh, I, I mean, I'm at three years, and I still, I don't have like that complete trust. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you just I mean? have to show them with like take action. Don't just keep saying, you know, I'm better, I'm better. You can trust me. You can trust me. Just show it to them, and it may take a few months, and it may take several years. It's just a matter of um, where you're at and what you're doing with your recovery. True. All right. So we'll move on to our next question, which um, we get questions via our Twitter and through via private messages. So again. I want to remind everybody, if you have a question for our, for our um, talent or our guests here, please feel free so to talented. comment those yeah. below. They are extremely talented. <laughs> um, this question is, can a person become addicted to medication that has been prescribed by a doctor? Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's how I started doing heroin. Yeah. I started doing Percocets before that. I was never prescribed. And uh, eventually, Percocets were too expensive, and I started shooting heroin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that's so common. Yeah. Um, and really, it, depending on the medication, it's possible to become physically dependent on a lot of medications. And where that's sort of different from being addicted the way we refer to it is that's somebody who's just going to have to go through detox, maybe a few days of being uncomfortable and kicking some pain medication, and then they're going to go back to the li their life the way it is. Mm 
Mm. But really, it's possible to get addicted to all kinds of things. You know, prescription mm. medications, gambling, co like cocaine, heroin. There's all kinds of things that, for one reason or another, will f like feel like that missing link, that thing that somebody is missing in their lives, mm -hmm. and they'll just latch on to it. You know, a lot of us, I, I know I did, you just said you did, like we found that starting with prescription medications. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's absolutely possible. That weren't mm -hmm. prescribed. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I started. Yeah. So they weren't prescribed, too expensive, shooting heroin. Common theme. Yeah. The next question that we have is, can I get addicted even if I only do it every once in a while? Um, yes, I would say. Uh, what Corey was just saying, uh, with the mental and physical addic addiction, you might not be physically addicted if you're just doing it every once in a while, but your mind can crave it and um, you could just sit there and that's all you think about all day is when you're going to get it next and uh, yeah, like just my answers, yeah. Because I feel uh, earlier on, it, like way in the beginning of my addiction, I didn't do pills every single day but I was addicted to them because that's all I could think about I was asking people hey do you know where to get them like hey do you have this do you have that and if I didn't get it I wasn't in a ton of pain but when I got it I just felt so much more at ease and comfortable with myself I mean that's how we all start yeah right yeah like I didn't immediately start to shoot heroin every day, right? I started by smoking weed every once in a while. I liked it. I was drinking in high school and I was doing that every once in a while, maybe weekends, whatever it is, but eventually like, I need it. Yeah. yeah. Every second of every day. And, I, and I've noticed, like looking back on my life and I didn't really see it at the time, there was a long time where I wasn't like physically dependent on any of the things I was doing. You know, it's not like I started shaking if I didn't get a drink. Like mm -hmm. I could go a few days without taking pills and not and feel fine. Yeah. But the entire focus of my life had shifted to drugs. If I wasn't doing them, I was thinking about doing them. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and if I was doing them, I was thinking about when I was going to do them again. And that was they, that was the center of my world at that point. Physically, like physically addicted or not, like my entire focus was on that. Like my goals changed, my entire outlook on life changed to center around that, and that was what was what I was going to do forever. You know. Yeah. So it's it's entirely possible. Yes. All right. So moving on to the next question, um, I think this refers to the daily teaching that we read f the uh, at the beginning of the show. It says, what phrases do you say to yourself to manage your thoughts, feelings, or behavior? I don't necessarily tell myself phrases. I just get up and do something about it. Stop, like, stop, poor me, poor me, poor me. Like, get up and change it. I don't know. I don't really say anything. One thing that just, it keeps running through my head anytime, especially when I'm super upset with the way things are going in my life is somebody told me a while back a, a kind of a long story explaining how my life isn't personal and it's it's a very long story I'm not going to go through the whole thing here but that'll be one thing that just keeps cycling in my head is like this isn't personal it's not happening to me because I'm Corey it's happening to me because I just happen to be standing it's here. your turn yeah. Yeah. yeah it's life you know life like I just I drew the short straw today this is what's going to happen and it's not personal and you know, that just, it'll keep playing in my head and it's way easier if I'm not taking it personally to work towards solving the problem or overcoming the situation rather than like wasting energy trying to blame people for what's come up in my life. Mm -hmm. So it's not personal is one of the things that I repeat to myself quite often. Um, when this happens, like, those things like anxiety or unhappiness or depression or whatever it is, right? Um, if I find myself in that place, I try to not let it take me on the ride, you know, and, and take that moment to pause and pray is what I would do first and then try to see what action I can take to 
improve upon the situation. Um, and that's what helps me. I know a lot of, I mean, if you're going to say something like a mantra or something like this too shall pass is pretty common. One day at a time. One day at a time. Right. Like um, things like that, that remind you that this is going to change. Like it's not going to stay like this. I'm going to be happy again. I'm going to, you know, like a lot of the times people I'll talk to, it's before you go to bed, right? Oh, that all gosh. these things mm-hmm. hit yeah. you at once. Right, and all you have to do is get to sleep. Right, mm-hmm. wake up tomorrow. It's a new day. You feel better, um, but it's tough, man. Definitely tough. But at least for me, pausing, praying, and then trying to take the next action, the next positive action. Mm-hmm. That's what tends to work. All right, moving on to the next question: Is do I really need to attend a treatment program, or can I just do the twelve steps? Uh, knowing nothing else about your situation. Right. (laughs) (laughs) I would recommend a treatment program just because, you know, like we've talked about here in the past, it, it gives people a break. You know, when I went through treatment, it gave me a break. You know, my life was still there waiting for me when I, well, the burned out wreckage of my life was still waiting for me. True. And... You know, I was separated from everything. I was in a safe place, like, and I was with a lot of people who were in a very similar position working towards a similar goal. You know, it gave me a safe place to kind of pull myself back together and try to wrap my head around the 12 steps because there's a lot to the steps that can be overwhelming if you're not sure what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. And to have other people to kind of guide you through that beginning phase is, like, it will, it, I don't think it would ever hurt anyone, but it will almost always help people. Does that make sense? Yeah. And like I said, you know, just to be in a safe place, kind of removed from the environment you were just in while you were using, like that seems beneficial to me. People are so afraid of treatment for some reason. Like if you've never been there, I understand. Like when I had never been to an inpatient treatment, I was like, I don't know about that. Mm-hmm. I had a lot of fun in treatment. Yeah. Me too. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Like, that was, uh, I had some really good times. I met some awesome people. Um, and, right, we have that common goal of getting sober. And, of course, the worst part about it is no drugs or no alcohol. Like, I'm freaking out. Um, but, I mean, you get distracted, right? And you're mm-hmm. able to build up those tools and build those relationships with other people who are trying to stay sober and getting sober. And I had so much fun, man. So I mean, I. I had a lot of fun Do it, what, doing whatever. And it's so important to have that, I think, because I need to remember that I can be a human again. Mm-hmm. Right. I really need to remember that. And treatment, inpatient, residential definitely helped me to realize yeah. that um i agree with both of you 100 percent. i also had so much fun in treatment like to this day i'll be sitting and thinking of the time in treatment and just start laughing to myself like the best times because it it did remind me that i could be human and it reminded me that i can make mistakes and get back up from them and just keep going and uh be the bianca that i've always wanted to be um be the b be the b <laughs> Um, yeah, so I went through a few treatment programs, and I'm not saying they didn't work. It's just I wasn't willing to get clean and sober. I just wasn't ready. I didn't want to do it. Uh, but this uh, last time where I finally just was completely done, I was actually in jail. I wasn't in a treatment program, and I just went to the 12 steps after uh, I got out of jail. I was still reading the book. I was doing meetings uh holding meetings in jail and doing what I could do, but it's like, I don't need it to move forward, but it's good to have. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are actually just about out of time here. I want to thank our guests for showing up and uh, being a part of this stream. And I want to also thank everyone that tuned in and asked questions. I want to remind everyone that we do this every Monday at 12 o'clock Pacific Standard Time and 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, In the meantime, if you have any questions, you can feel free to message those uh, to us directly. And if you need any more information about treatment or um, things relating to recovery, you can always visit our website at www.detoxtorehab.com. Have a good week. True.